Um, it's good to be back in Canada where the color has an extra letter and everything's nice. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about sound synthesis, which is something we sort of just recently started working on. Um, so the future sounds good, the coming age of physically based sound rendering. So this is work with uh, a number of my students and uh, also Dinesh. And, uh, so the basic motivation for why we should do sound rendering of physics is, is kind of interesting. Uh, we basically have this great story in computer graphics and physically based animation where over the last uh, three or four or five decades we've gone from early beginnings in interactive computer graphics beginning with pictures of Fred Park's wife and early ray tracing of uh, spheres and so on, all the way up to very sophisticated systems for rendering uh, computer graphics and realistic characters and physics and interactive interfaces, all converging on this very highly sophisticated systems for rendering physics and graphics and lighting uh, interactive and parallel rates, which is going to push off into the future and become you know, even better and, and, and more unbelievable than ever before. And if we just sit back and, you know, as wait for the singularity to approach, then it'll become this incredible immersive experience and it'll be all very wonderful. And so at this fantastic time, we should take and pause for a moment to think about what this man is doing in the picture. Um, so, you know, you know, can't resist. Uh, what is he doing actually? And um, so actually he's making the present sound better because currently, uh, you know, we lack a lot of algorithms for actually rendering all kinds of different things. So you have to sort of put the sounds in any way you can. And, and this makes a lot of sense for movies for all kinds of other reasons. And this goes back to early work by, by this fellow, Jack Foley, who introduced Foley artistry into the, into the motion picture industry with hits like Showboat, Dracula, and Spartacus for you know, putting in sounds of heroin slamming doors and, and swords clanking and all kinds of things that are otherwise hard to get into your movie. And this could sort of improve the realism of all kinds of uh, different motion picture stuff. And so it's been such a hit that, you know, now in the 21st century, we have super duper, uh, you know, approaches to that, like Skywalker Sound, where you send the, your movie and they'll add this over the top, uh, better than ever um, sound effects. And they can do this for movies and make sound recordings for video games and get sound where you need it. And it's, it's you know, works really well. Um, so at this point, we basically have an interesting scenario, and I can't resist making this video either, off by 100 error in the date slightly. But we basically have these fantastic algorithms for doing physically based animation of fluids and cloth and all kinds of amazing stuff. And we just add the sound in at the end, right? So it's just the same as it was 100 years ago. And uh, off we go into interactive virtual reality, right? But the problem is, is that there's no little Foley guy inside your computer to produce these automatic synchronized sounds for you on the fly. How do we do this? Gee, we didn't really do that, did we? So why is physically based sound rendering in its infancy? And there's a lot of great reasons. One, the success of Foley artists and sound recording. It works great. There's a lot of inertia. It, it, you know, people keep doing it. Other reasons like the acoustic community is focused on things like making quieter mufflers or placing sound sources in virtual environments, but not really worrying about where the sound source actually came from, except for really important things like speech and musical instruments. And so at this point, there's really a lack of efficient algorithms for computing sounds for all kinds of physical sound sources, like objects crashing around, breaking, splashing fluids, all kinds, of, all kinds of different things, anything you can hear. And it's part because only the physics has only been practical to simulate only recently. Computers are really slow. This is the dark ages after all, practically. And it's really hard to actually compute all these sounds. You have to do the graphics and the geometry. Then you've got to do the physics to make it move and animate it. And then you've got to figure out how to vibrate and makes all this sound. It's really terribly complicated. Um, so what I want to talk about in this talk is how we can go about making methods for automatically producing sounds for anything you can see uh, and hear around you. And so the basic approach I'm going to talk about is abstracted in this example, where we basically have any object. Say we look at 
an object colliding with the ground like a plastic water bottle, and there's some vibration. This vibration may be nonlinear. It's some structure. It vibrates. We can compute that. It may take days. Hopefully, we can speed that up. And then there's some radiation that comes out of there. Every little vibration mode, say, of this object will produce some sound field around it. And we can figure out that radiation field by trying to solve the wave equation or something like this. And then finally, there's you. And you convolve yourself with this sound field and hear some interesting groovy vibrations. And that's ultimately what we want to compute. So we want to do time domain synthesis of all these kinds of crashes and bonks and splashes and whatever. And, and that's really what we're talking about. OK, so I just wanted to give you some preview before not make you stay to the end of the talk to hear sounds. So here's some examples of some sounds that we computed just this year. Um, this one is for computing vibrations of elastic structures, like thin shells that vibrate in a nonlinear way. And this is another example showing sound synthesized for a splashing fluid, or in this case, a babbling water step by my student, uh, Chauncey Zhang. So in both of these examples, we've used you know, our technology for computer graphics and physically-based animation to make things move. And then we've gone just one little extra step farther to automatically produce procedural sounds for, for these in virtual environments. Uh, currently, the techniques are not real time, but we have to figure out what we want to compute and compute it right before we can figure out how to speed it up. Okay. So in the talk, and I encourage people to ask questions at any time, um, I'm going to talk about these following things. A little bit on linear modal sound synthesis, how do we make vibrations and so on. And then talk about how these vibrations produce sound in, in the surrounding space. And I'll talk about acoustic transfer and some methods we use for approximating that. Um, then I'll talk about how to make the vibrations couple together, how to make modes couple and get nonlinear vibrations so we can have crashes and rumbles, real you know, dirty sounds like that instead of clean ringing, dinging sounds. And then I'll talk about complex phenomena like fluids. How can we compute splashing, babbling fluid sounds? Okay. So just to have a little bit of related work, just so the main approach for producing sound in games and movies in particular, we're interested in games because they can be interactive and have a real uh, motivation for interactive procedural algorithms. Um, recorded sounds are widely used from Foley artists to produce synchronized sounds, but it, obviously this is not going to work uh, as great for your interactive environment because you have to produce the sound right away and you don't have a Foley chip in your computer. Uh, the other thing you can do is have canned sounds like this wonderful splashing sound. And Dinesh uh, convinced me a long time ago that uh, you know, canned sounds are great, but uh, they aren't necessarily synchronized with what you're doing. If the sound changes, you, know, you need a large library of sounds over and over again. And uh, ultimately, they can be rather repetitive and you know, very irritating. So he, I saw him do this uh, like 10 or 12 years ago at an IRIS meeting, and it was you know, very effective. OK. OK, so other work. I mean. People have been doing a lot of work on sound rendering, and often it's due to sound propagation or oralization. You have a sound source, like a recording of somebody's voice, you know, uh, like Humphrey Bogart, and then he's in a particular space, a smoky bar, right? And so you, you try to figure out how to put that sound in that space and so that it sounds realistic, and how to do this interactively so you can push a button on a space shuttle and hear that click, and it sounds like you're really there. Um, but this is, not, this is less concerned with how the actual sound is made in the first place, the sound source, the dry sound. It's more focused on uh, propagation effects. Um, there's other work on how to produce sound for, ri for rigid objects using linear modal sounds, which I'll talk about, and how to make that sound a little more realistic with acoustic transfer. For general deformable sounds, there's less work. And the methods there are more like uh, brute force engineering approaches, which can be really slow, sort of like days to produce the sound for an object with only a small number of elements. And that can be not really practical for our, our sound synthesis approach. OK, so the first thing I'm talk about is linear modal sound synthesis. So how can we do this? So any physical structure, we can approximate it using a finite element model and then take 
the, the, the linear vibration modes for the structure, we can extract them using a standard eigenvalue decomposition. So here's this bell, and I can go ahead and compute all these different mode shapes of the bell and a corresponding frequency for that mode. And then at runtime, I can simply hit the object and figure out how each of those modes are excited, and then I get some nice uh, pure harmonic vibrations. And so that story sort of looks like this, where I hit the object and say the first mode vibrates, it gets excited, and then has this uh, exponentially decaying sinusoid or cosine that describes its motion, and all the other modes get excited in some particular way. So at the end of the day, you basically have a whole bunch of little vibrations. You can add these together and you get a sound that you can hear. You might decide it should get quieter when you get farther away, so maybe you add a one over R effect. And this will get you some sounds that you can do all kinds of fun things with. Um, so this type of model, this sort of uh, monopole-like model for sound, uh, essentially has some weighted combination of the amplitudes of each of these vibration modes, and then you can produce a sound-like uh, effect with that. And if you have um, some weights that aren't unit, you can, you can approximate some approximation of the sound far away from the object, which is correct in the, in the low frequency limit for closed objects. And, and this can produce some, some good sounds in that case, but unfortunately, that's not really the case for most of the objects that we're interested in. In particular, sort of the, the sound field, the pressure field around an object for a particular vibration mode, here's a low mode, low frequency mode, and here's a high frequency mode. You can see that these modes don't have this sort of one over R fall off in intensity. There's a lot of weird stuff going on here. There's, uh, it's louder in some directions than others by a large amount. And so really we want to capture that non-point-like sound source property of the object because it's important for what you hear and where you hear it. And part of that is due to the fact that there's a lot of diffraction for sound waves that we hear with certain speeds. Uh, for the range of audible frequencies we're interested in, the wavelengths vary from like 21 meters to 17 millimeters. And in that wide range of scales, those waves will interact with the shapes of the objects and the vibration modes of the object to produce a wide range of amplitudes for how well these shapes, which are kind of like 3D loudspeakers, radiate sounds for particular frequencies. And so unlike graphics, where this is only really important for tiny structures, for sound, diffraction is very important for the, the, the radiated sound. And to just give you an illustration of this, here's a, a, a bell that I showed you the vibration modes of before that's been hit by a clangor and is going back and forth. And with, if you include those diffraction effects in the radiation model, then you get sound that varies as the object moves around. And so here you can hear, I hope, the di di directionality effects of the object. And uh, here's an example without that. You just render it as a point source and you're missing that directionality effect. Plus, the actual sound is inconsistent with the uh, wave radiation models uh, of, of the vibration. And so you can't hear any directionality effects. And it also sounds very different from what it did before because it's, it's actually not really what the sound is supposed to sound like. Okay. So, the thing we want to do is then, if we have some object that has some vibrations, how can we figure out what the sound is going to be like at some point in space? And we can do that by modeling acoustic transfer for these vibrations. So here's a simple way to, to model the transfer. So there's some sort of pressure field, which is a complex valued field, that describes the, wave, wave, the harmonic waves around the object. And if we just look at the amplitude of that function, it sort of tells you where it's allowed for that particular vibration mode. And we can compute these transfer functions for every vibration mode of this rigid object. And that'll tell us where that mode is loud. And uh, if we multiply it by some, our little modal amplitude vibration, this little function, that will give us a model of, of the amplitude of the, of the sound at any point in space. There are more complicated models you could use, but this is, this is one that's sufficient for the, the talk. Um, so the problem is we have to evaluate the transfer function for each of these modes, say hundreds or maybe a thousand modes, for every object in the scene, and we have to do that throughout time. So it's potentially a, a large calculation to do. And so let's just look at some of these functions for starters. I always like to look at the data and see what it's doing. Uh, so I'll subject you to 40 modes from this uh, small dragon figurine. Why not? That's my talk. I can do it. <laughs> 
Okay, so the first mode looks like this. It's pretty low frequency and not very interesting. But as the frequency starts to go up with these vibrations, you can notice that there's all of a sudden a lot, a lot more structure. In this case, it's not really going that fast, but as I start to get up into the kilohertz range, this is about uh, uh, kilohertz right now, and as I go towards three or four kilohertz at the end of this, you can see that there uh, starts to be more angular structure in, in the sound field around the object. The other thing is that some of these modes are like 100 times louder than the other ones, but I've normalized them all so they're roughly the same brightness. And so once we can represent these functions, then we can describe the amplitude of the, of the, of the pressure field at any point around the object. Okay? And then we can animate and listen to these waves. Um, okay, so first of all, how do we actually compute these transfer functions? Well, you can get them by solving the Helmholtz equation. So essentially, for any vibration mode of the surface, it tells us how, say, any triangles on the surface vibrate normal to the surface. And then we know the frequency of the vibration, say, from an eigenvalue decomposition or some other way. And that tells us the wave number of the waves in the surrounding fluid. Um, so to find the pressure at any point, we just solve the Helmholtz equation in the, in the surrounding space, subject to some boundary condition on the surface of the object, essentially. And this tells us how the pressure changes. So we have to do this for every mode of the object for every object. And this is uh, uh, you know, un unfortunate. Um, but basically, we can solve a boundary integral equation on the surface of the model, and then we can evaluate the pressure at any surrounding location. And in practice, we don't want to actually evaluate the solution uh, if it's too expensive, because we want to do this very fast at audio rates to evaluate uh, uh, sounds, sound synthesized sounds. Okay, so what we do in, in some cases, we can approximate the solution, compute the solution ahead of time, and then approximate it using some very fast evaluate functions. So the basic story is we have this pressure field, and what we can do is find a, a bunch of simple sources that we place inside some, some offset surface, which also produce a similar field and satisfy some boundary conditions on, on, the, on the region. And I won't go into the details, but essentially this allows us to approximate the model using a bunch of very simple sources, like simple dipole sources. Uh, and in practice, this works pretty well, but you need a lot of sources to approximate the function because as you get to higher and higher modes or higher and higher frequencies, the number of sources you need increases because the sound field becomes more and more complicated. And, and so this is fine. We can use more sources to approximate the sound field, but it also becomes harder to build these approximations. And then at runtime, it's more expensive to evaluate. So one really simple thing we've done lately is just use a simple texture map approach, which turns out to work quite well. Um, so here's an object, like this is actually a trash can. And at low frequencies, you can see the structure. And as you go to higher frequencies, you see increasing radial structure. But the, the, the key thing here is you notice that the, the model essentially looks like a point-like source with a lot of angular structure, uh, which increases at these high frequencies. So the approach that we use is, is really simple, and it works quite well. It's basically to consider the pressure about the object as essentially a point-like source multiplied by some expansion in increasing uh, orders of 1 over r functions. And basically, you just use some pictures here. Essentially, you have this 1 over r radiating wave coming out of a point-like sound source, but we multiply it by things that have lots of angular structure. And this is basically like a world map of the of the sphere and showing you where it's loud and where it's quiet. And this gets multiplied by this expansion in 1 over r powers. And this simple uh, expansion uh, is quite effective. We call these, these texture maps uh, far field acoustic transfer maps, or FAT maps for short. And uh, this is work done by my student Jeffrey Chadwick and Stephen Ahn. And they basically allow you to have a really simple asymptotic expansion. It's trivial to evaluate. And it allows you to get very low air transfer estimates. The key thing is that instead of summing over lots of dipoles or, or something or a fast multipole expansion, you actually can get basically a constant time evaluation of the pressure at any point, which allows you to evaluate the sound amplitudes for hundreds of modes in some uh, you know, 100 microseconds or so. And uh, so these models are really straightforward to compute, but you have to have access to the transfer function in the first place. So we still need all that, the structure to know what's going on. 
So we rely on you know, one of the best algorithms of the 20th century, the fast multipole uh, method, to basically evaluate the pressure uh, around the object. And in order to actually figure out how this works for any ray direction, what we do is we just evaluate the pressure at some specific locations on some concentric spheres, uh, corresponding to a particular theta and phi in our spherical, spherical uh, map. And then we just fit the, our expansion to those points uh, using least squares. And this turns out to work uh, quite well. And so here are some, some fat maps for a particular object, a trash can, which I'll show you later. Um, so here's a particular mode, mode 140. And um, this is an ex the first two terms from a, a four-term expansion, which basically fit the radiation field to 1% air, which is far less than you can actually hear. And, and you can see there's all this interesting structure where, at what angles it's loud and what angles it's quiet. So it's, it's quite complicated, which is typical of a lot of these radiation fields. Um, and here's another example here. So basically what we do is we pre-compute the detailed structure, bake it into a texture map at runtime. We just do a texture lookup and get the amplitude of that mode. And that is a really simple, fast way to, to evaluate all this junk. And here's the most psychedelic slide. Oh, it's even better with uh, two, two projectors. So um, anyway, so here basically I've shown you just a subset of the textures we use for the tr a trash can, and here's the water bottle example. And we basically store these textures uh, with some adaptive sampling, and then just do texture lookups at runtime and can evaluate this at, at very, very fast rates for real-time rendering. OK. And just to convince you it's sort of what kind of accuracy you can get, so here on one side is the ground truth. On the other side is the, the fat map approximation around the object. And I'll, uh, you know, if you can tell a difference, then I'll tell you which one is which. Okay, so I think actually the one on the right was the approximation. Okay, so now that you can use uh, a large number of, of maps and get very low accuracy, go, sorry, very low error, you know, very low accuracy is a solved problem, right? <laughs> so we can get less than 1% accuracy, basically just bake the fast multipole solutions into texture maps. And then we can also use uh, fewer terms and get sort of uh, tens of percents accuracy. And in practice, these models actually sound quite good. So we still have to use more resolution to encode the higher angular structure, but it's only a memory overhead, and we have order one transfer evaluation. So here's a comparison. Uh, here's the ground truth evaluated using a fast multipole method for listening positions along uh, the trajectory of your ear. And this example took 13 hours to evaluate. Um, and so the, the sounds should sound pretty similar. Uh, the sh I can't tell the difference. Um, the main benefit is that we just bake the, the model, the, 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 the fancy solution, into a texture using these squares. And here's an illustration of what it sounds like if you use more textures or fewer textures. Uh, this one with one texture is on the order of tens of percent accuracy, but it's very uh, hard to hear the difference when you're farther away from the object. So I encourage you to actually listen to these sounds afterwards with headphones. You'll be able to hear uh, minor differences if you have better ears than I do. OK. So at this point, we've talked about how to take a vibration and produce some sound field. And I told you you can basically solve that with a texture lookup at runtime so that it runs in real time. One challenge is, is looking at vibrations which aren't purely harmonic, but actually have modes that couple together. And when you do this, it turns out that it's very difficult to capture this nonlinearity without taking a whole lot of time. Uh, so one of the motivations for this is we want to do audio rate synthesis of vibrations and radiation, but we have lots of geometry. You know, people like Robert can, can generate detailed meshes, and we want to have very arbitrarily complicated structures and produce all the sound from them. So how do we deal with all the geometric times temporal complexity that we're going to have to see?
Uh, here's an illustration of one of the challenges. You can just use traditional methods to time step the vibrations. So here's this water bottle with only tens of thousands of triangles. If we just do a standard explicit Newmark time stepping scheme, we get a sound. And then we can do our, our reduced order model, which I'll talk about in a bit. So this model is less accurate, but the most salient difference in practice is probably that this one took 19 days to compute, a five second clip, uh, and this one uh, only took about three hours. So in practice, that's, that's uh, a significant difference. And, uh, and so we'd like to be able to take a model and then spend as much time as we want getting a solution, but not uh, spend uh, too much. Because if you have three objects, then you know, that's a lot more work, right? So. OK, so in practice, we can do this by taking the dynamics of the full system and projecting it down into a subspace and integrating the dynamics in a subspace. Um, so basically, in practice, we have a detailed mesh that has maybe n degrees of freedom. And, uh, and so we have to integrate this in our n-dimensional space here, drawn very orthogonal like that. And in practice, we can project it down into an r-dimensional subspace that maybe has hundreds of degrees of freedom for the hundreds of modes of vibration of this uh, nearly uh, slightly nonlinear structure. And, and so in practice, what we want to do is find the dynamics in this low-dimensional space, hopefully faster, and hopefully in a way that produces similar sounds to what we had before. And, and so these small coordinates, q, are a small vector of these amplitudes of, say, these vibration modes that have some nonlinear coupling. So we want to find the time series for q over time so we know how the structure vibrates. And that's essentially what we're going to try to do. Um, so this is a topic called dimensional model reduction or subspace integration. And linear modal analysis is a special case. But in general, you can take a nonlinear ODE, just like an n-dimensional ODE, with some nonlinear term for the internal vibration, internal forces in the, in the deformable object, and basically project this down into a subspace. So you substitute the coordinate transformation so that the displacements of the model are given by the linear superposition of these R modes. And then you project it down into an R-dimensional subspace. So you get an R-dimensional ODE. Um, so without, without loss of generality, you end up with some reduced equations of motion that tell you the dynamics of these, the small vector of modal amplitudes. And there's this ugly nonlinear term here, uh, which in practice is, is, the, is the difficulty in evaluating. But if we can evaluate this, then we'll be able to find out the amplitudes of these modes. And there can be nonlinear coupling. And we'll get these crashing, rumbling sounds that are characteristic of, of these sort of more chaotic coupled motions. And you already know the, the, the simplest case of linear modal analysis. So it turns out that that internal force in the subspace is, it, when you do linear modal analysis, you linearize things and decouple uh, the dynamics. And so the force response of any of the modes is only proportional to the amplitude of that mode. And you get this nice linear force response. And you can integrate this in basically order r time for our dimensional uh, system. And this is the, the key to linear, linear uh, sound methods for modal analysis, why they're so fast in real time. In the general case, uh, this is uh, expensive because you have to deform the model using this linear superposition, get the forces, all the vertices, and then project them back into the subspace. The picture looks like this. You start off with the amplitudes of, say, your 200 modes. You deform the mesh into that new shape, which is expensive because it depends on all of the degrees of freedom, the big N degrees of freedom in your system. And then you evaluate the forces, get the forces on all the vertices, and then project them back down into the subspace to get the small little r-dimensional force vector. And that's, that's the process to evaluate the forces, but it's expensive because it depends on big N, essentially. And so what we really like is just to go and skip all this junk and go directly to the, the small little r-dimensional force vector without looking at everything. So it's a, it's a typical fast algorithm where the fast algorithm basically closes its eyes and says, forget about the complexity. I will find the simpler way there by ignoring everything. OK, so basically what we're going to do is, is, is exploit the fact that the force is actually the gradient of some energy function. And this function basically looks like the integral over the domain of the object of some small little r-dimensional vector of integrands, the force density function. 
And anyway, so to make a short story short, well, it's pretty short, is we can, we can just take and sum over a small number of points on the model with some magic weights, which we'll find, and some magic positions. And if we choose these guys really good, then we'll be able to do the integral with not too much inaccuracy, and it'll be fast. And so we can take a model with lots of elements, say one like this with 400,000 elements, and then pick some magic points on the object and some magic weights, and we'll be able to get the, the solution in, in a fast time. So in practice, we can evaluate our dimensional forces and order R squared operations and independent of big N. And so for hundreds of modes, we can evaluate the forces in, in milliseconds. So that means we can time step the, the model really quickly and get the force response uh, for audio purposes. Um, so this approach, which was done with my, my student, who was actually in his first year at the time, Stephen Ahn, and then Ted Kim, who's now at University of Saskatchewan, allows you to integrate nonlinear forces with complex geometry and nonlinear materials. And uh, we basically take in a subspace model of modes and then evaluate a force model that can be run at runtime. So the key idea here is that when you have a, a structure that's deforming in some, say, modal way or some redundant way, is that if I just stretch this, there's a lot of redundancy between all the elements. So if I want to compute the sum over this domain of its response given by this color, then if, if there's redundancy in how I'm stretching it, there's redundancy in the integrand, and then doing the integral should be easy in some sense, because all the values are the same in this case, right? So if I have to sum up all the colors to find the average color, it should be easy. Um, and so this is analogous to essentially Gaussian quadrature, where you can use n points to evaluate a 2n dimensional polynomial subspace. But now, instead of just a regular, you know, just a uniform interval, uh, we want to actually find a quadrature scheme that can integrate a function on an arbitrary shape domain. It could be Gumby or a Bell or whatever, and it, for some arbitrary deformations and nonlinear responses. So there's some subspace of functions we want to integrate on a weird domain. What is the scheme for that domain? That's all we want to do. So uh, we basically use a, an approximation scheme that says, give us the model and how it deforms and the forces, and we basically figure out a subset of, of, of elements to evaluate on the model, such that we can only spend uh, a, a sublinear and big N amount of time evaluating the cost. And so in practice, we can do this in order R squared cost. So just to summarize, we take in a model uh, which has some modes of, of vibration that say we get from linear analysis. And then we deform this nonlinear model into a bunch of weird shapes, which are typical of the kind of shapes we're going to see at, for our forces in, in sound synthesis. And then we optimize our cubature so that it can produce similar forces uh, in the training process. At runtime, then, we just sum over the small number of elements to get, to get the force response for the system. And, uh, and this can be made fast. So I'm not going to go into why it's order R squared. Uh, I'll just briefly mention how we actually train the system which might be interesting for some people. Um, so we basically have a bunch of poses of the object, a bunch of different Q amplitudes for weird little vibrating shapes. And then we know what the forces are in, that, in, that, in those poses, and we can compute those ahead of time using the brute force approach. And so given these, this training vector, we basically can do a function approximation for F of Q. Uh, instead of using radial basis functions or something, which may be hard to train or overfit or lack positive definite stiffness matrices. We use a, a non-negative least squares training method, which picks a bunch of points in some magic way, and then trains the weights so that they best fit the, the, the model. Um, so if we, if we have a bunch of points, we can train the weights using non-negative least squares. So we use non-negative least squares because then the weights are positive, which is good for a quadrature scheme in, in this particular case. Um, and Essentially, given a, a bunch of locations on the model, we can find the weights that correspond to it to produce the force sample for a given training pose T for a given shape of the model. And then, in practice, we use a bunch of shapes, uh, capital T different uh, training poses, to train the model. So given a set of points, we just optimize the weights using non-negative least squares, which is an efficient way to, to do that. Um, because some of the model's poses may be deformed a lot and have really huge forces, we normalize uh, by the uh, amplitude of the forces to basically fit uh, the relative error instead of just the uh, total force values. 
Um, and so we use a simple greedy subset selection approach, which says essentially the following. So that if we have a fit to the model, where we have some uh, A, W minus equals B model that we're trying to fit, and then we have some residual error that's not quite approximating these forces, then we can try to find a, a new column to add to our basis. And so we basically choose a bunch of random points, for example, on the object and say, let's consider these guys for, for new cubature points. And then we look at the one that's most positively aligned with the residual, and then we can add that to our basis for our matrix, and then update the weights for that using non-negative least squares. When you do that, then you get a new residual. Hopefully it's smaller, right? And then you uh, estimate a new column to add, which is most positively aligned. And you incrementally do this to find a set of points and, and train them as you go. Um, in practice, we can try to not evaluate all the, all the possible. The, the matrix can be really large if we consider all the points in the model. And, and to avoid that, we basically use a subset of, of these points uh, in practice or, or limit the number of rows. Uh, but the, the general problem is given, given a model for AW equals B for all of the possible candidate points, find uh, the sparsest set of, of weights on the model such that the error is bounded and uh, the weights are positive. And that's essentially what we approximate. Okay. So the key thing is that for a given number of dimensions, uh, a given rank of the model R, we only need a, a number of cubature samples which appear to be order R in practice. So they're linear with the number of dimensions, uh, which is great because it, it leads to an efficient algorithm for runtime, an order R squared algorithm, which we can use for sound synthesis. And uh, we also compared it to other approaches such as Monte Carlo, where we pick points at random and use uniform weights. Or if we pick those points and then we train the weights, versus our approach, which optimizes the positions and the weights. And in practice, we see that uh, the Monte Carlo converges slowly. You know, I have to take a lot of samples to make it work. So if you're only taking one sample per dimension, it's not going to converge very quickly. And if you optimize those weights, it's slightly better. But if you optimize the points and the weights, then it tends to converge uh, much more rapidly. Um, so here's an example, to get back to the sound synthesis story, uh, of a plate modeled using 400,000 tetrahedra. And in practice, we can use uh, 900 cubature points to get a, a relatively low error. Uh, and this allows us to speed up the sound synthesis time uh, by a large factor. And so it goes from days to hours. Um, Okay, so here's an example. This just took four days on a 16-core machine. And it sounds indistinguishable, even though it took hours. And the linear model sounds distinctly different, but it runs in real time. So none of these examples had any uh, acoustic transfer on them, so they're not, they shouldn't be expected to sound uh, uh, correct. But you can see the difference that uh, the approach makes. So we wanted to go further with this and try to actually compute it for shells. Uh, in practice, uh, harmonic shells are, sorry, uh, thin shells are actually interesting models because, because they're thin, they can bend very easily, but they don't like to stretch. So if you compute vibration modes, and they try to stretch the surface, they won't be allowed. So it turns out that the modes couple together very strongly and produce nonlinear vibration effects, which produce rumbling and crashing and characteristic you know, garbage can kind of sounds. And we all like garbage cans. So uh, in fact, it's hard to produce these kind of rumbling sounds using a linear model. So we wanted to do this. Okay, so basically, this, this, uh, that method is computed using harmonic shells, which is basically the far field acoustic transfer maps, this fast evaluation of accurate transfer with uh, the thin shell cubature scheme. And so we basically extended the cubature approach to thin shells, which is relatively straightforward. Um, so the key idea here is to capture mode coupling. So if I strike a symbol uh, modeled using linear modes and I allow them to be coupled together, uh, instead of seeing the, mo the vibration produce this uh, sort of damped sinusoid type behavior in the gray linear case, the nonlinear mode coupling shows ex ex significantly different behavior. 
And you can see that this, this particular high frequency mode has been coupled to uh, lower frequency modes because of these subharmonics. And so capturing this coupling makes the sound a little more interesting. It doesn't have this pure ding, ringing tone. It sort of sounds a little more noisy. And, and that's what we'd like to cap capture. And you can see this in the linear case when you hit the model. Each mode has a very distinct frequency response. In the nonlinear case, they're blurred out and coupled. And there's long, st stronger subharmonic coupling behaviors. OK. So in the, in the thin shell case, essentially, there's some background material on how thin shells deform, which I don't want to go into. But basically, there's some energy functions for the stretching uh, membrane response and then also for a bending response of the shell. And this gives you some energy term for describe the energy of any given shape of the model, okay, which is an integral over the surface, which can be broken down in an integral over all of the triangles on the surface. And so we don't want to look at all the triangles. We just want to look at a subset of them so that we can integrate the dynamics quickly. And so basically, we look at internal forces, which are just the gradient of some energy term, and an integral over all of the triangles. And so. We do the, the cubature approach, which looks at subspace dynamics of the system and project into an R-dimensional subspace for some, some hundreds of modes of the structure. And so we basically use a cubature trick to convert an integral over all the triangles to an integral over a subset of the triangles for some magic weights and locations. And, and that's essentially uh, all we do. And here's a, an example with a trash can that has 200 modes. And we use 800 cubature features to reach about 10% error on, on, the, on the forces. OK, so here's some results. Um, the basic thing I want you to get from this slide is that there's tens or hundreds of thousands of degrees of freedom for the models with hundreds of modes. And we use real ranges of frequencies with real materials. We don't tune parameters to get the frequencies right. We just use real parameters for polycarbonate or bronze and thicknesses of, of the shells that we think are appropriate. And, uh, and we integrate them all at audio rates using an explicit subspace integrator. Okay. Um, so here's a bunch of results. So I'll skip that. Um, so in practice, these simulations took on the order of a couple hours to evaluate in each case and, and not in the days range. Um, in each case, we use the cubature scheme to evaluate the forces. So here's an illustration of just the error of using the cubature scheme. Um, one of the major benefits is that you can take large time steps in the subspace model, but you can still see the effect of the error. slightly unconstrained mode in that case. Uh, and then here's the same example I showed you earlier with the unreduced case where we took 19 days versus three hours. <laughs> 
if you increase the accuracy of the cubature, you capture some more of that bassy, low frequency, which is otherwise too stiff. Okay, we also compare it to other methods, so we can see it's hard to actually evaluate the, the ground truth answer, so we compared it to other methods to see how they, uh, what sort of results they produce. We did four cases. One is the nonlinear subspace dynamics with the fat map transfer, which is this harmonic shells approach. We also compared to previous linear vibration models with the, with the transfer, and uh, we also compared against linear dynamics with a simpler monopole sound transfer model. And finally, we did a, an, an example with nonlinear dynamics, but a simple radiation model just for comparison purposes. This is the most popular type of method used in, say, games or other type of applications. So this is a large ride symbol, just for reference. Results are only approximate. Hopefully, you agree that there's capturing some of the nonlinear vibration and sound radiation in a, in a you know, principled way is a useful thing to do. Um, so the last the last thing I wanted to talk about is is our work on um, synthesizing fluid sounds. So this was work by my PhD student Chauncey Zhang uh, at Cornell, and this was at SIGGRAPH 2009. So the goal of the project is you know we we. We already know how to simulate uh, fluids using you know, approaches like Robert Britson have invented and a n number of other people. And what we'd like to do is to actually synthesize sounds for these as well. Um, so one thing that immediately confronted us was you know, where do the actual sounds come from? Like how do fluids make sound, like if you splash water around? And it turns out that the tiny bubbles are actually surprisingly loud. They're essentially the little you know, pixel primitives for uh, fluid sound. And, and there's actually a lot of work on this in, in uh, understanding how fluids make sound uh, for about 100 years. Um, so here's an example that's kind of inter interesting. It shows a tiny little 3.2 millimeter droplet falling into a pool of water. And there's a microphone just under the surface, uh, which currently is not really recording much of anything. Uh, but when the droplet hits the surface, it still doesn't really record much of anything. Um, but as the actual uh, impact produces a tiny bubble right here. All of a sudden, bing, there's a strong vibration. So this tiny little bubble acts like a monochromatic vibration source to, to leading order, which produces strong vibrations as it compresses air inside it with very strong surface tension forces. And that causes the fluid to vibrate and sound to be radiated. Um, and so what we, what we do in this, uh, this paper is basically model the whole process of how the surface mixes and produces tiny bubbles, how they're entrained, how those bubbles vibrate, what frequencies, and how they're advected along and make the surface vibrate and ultimately irradiate sound towards your ears. And we call this uh, our method of harmonic fluids. Um, so there's a lot of, not very much other work on sound synthesis for fluids, although there was this vortex-based approach, which it can make little bears very scary uh, when they swing their clubs around. Uh, and these are essentially whistling type sounds. There's also work on capturing bubble-based fluid sounds for stochastic uh, sound models, which Case Van and Dool actually worked on, and some other people who recorded fluid sounds and played them back when pictures of uh, water were being shown on the computer. Um, these approaches uh, can produce fluid-like sounds, but they don't, aren't synchronized with the actual 3D physics of a particular simulation and 
and transfer is typically not modeled. Um, so this approach is actually the first approach for synthesizing fluid sounds that's synchronized with 3D fluid animations and essentially computed uh, from first principle. We model the dynamics of the bubbles, the surface vibration, and the sound radiation. This part is essentially a transfer computation baked in with vibration. Uh, so here's a preview of our results. Remember, these are not, this is not like a, a mature area. This is the first uh, approach essentially for computing these sounds. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about then is the pipeline for computing that sound. Um, the first step is to simulate a bubbly flow where we have some fluid splashing and then making little bubbles. And then the second part is essentially, uh, you know, we, we can simulate these bubbles and how they vibrate and move around. And then at some point it's going to make sound. So we have to model the process by which it vibrates the surface and then produces sound radiation in the air. And this is essentially a Helmholtz radiation problem. And then finally, there's the process of actually listening to the sound and integrating it at runtime. Um, so the first part is simulating the fluid. So instead of actually time-stepping the fluid at audio rates and simulating compressive waves in this complex fluid domain, we decided to use uh, standard proven approaches for simulating fluids that are used in graphics for, for visual simulation. And in particular, we use a method that Robert invented uh, for, for simulating uh, incompressible flows uh, using the flip method. And, and so the main benefit here is that we can exploit the fact that uh, even though we really maybe would like to time step everything at audio rates and capture things, um, in practice, the wave speed for, for sound waves and fluid is like a kilometer and a half per second, right? So if you have a little thing of water that's vibrating, uh, those waves are traveling and bouncing around in there so fast that we really don't want to have to time step them bouncing around. We just want to capture them essentially uh, inside this 3D loudspeaker that's changing shape and moving around and vibrating in some particular way. So we basically compute the flow and the shape of the fluid and then do a vibration analysis of it as it moves along, vibrating at the particular frequencies of the bubbles. And then use linear superposition of the bubbles to figure out how they all produce sound together. So the actual process of modeling bubbles, how they are entrained and produced is complicated and essentially subgrid uh, scale physics. We have a simple stochastic model that basically models how surface particles are, are mixed together and get in, trapped below the surface and, and produce uh, bubbles. So this is a sort of a stochastic process that runs along with the fluid simulation and can figure out places where lots of mixing is occurring and produce bubbles of, of appropriate scales. Uh, the actual process of bubble creation is, is far more complicated. Uh, the next part is how the bubble vibrates. And, and so essentially you can think of the bubble, the leading order is just a simple sphere that has some tiny radius pulsations. And this produces most of the sound that, that it's making. So it's been well known for almost 100 years that, that you can model these dynamics using a simple harmonic oscillator where the amplitude of the vibration satisfies some sort of first order, or sec sorry, second order ODE. And so the parameters for like the damping and the frequency and the bubble's mass can be looked up and there are well-known formulas for modeling these sort of things. Um, one, one issue is actually capturing the driving force of the model and how the bubble is excited as it's mixing around. And it's actually quite complicated, but a simple model that we use is just that when the bubble is entrained, it immediately goes from having sort of a region with atmospheric pressure to one that has uh, more pressure due to surface tension. And this extra surface tension force, you can see, has this sort of one over the radius of the bubble uh, factor here. And so when the bubble is like one millimeter, this can be a really large force. And, uh, and so in practice, we model this as a delta function, and that captures an initial kick or impulse that makes the bubble vibrate. Okay, another detail that seemed like a minor detail but actually turned out to be important, uh, and, and Case also, I, I believe, uh, discovered this in his, his work, was that the rising pitch of the bubble turns out to be perceptually important. So as the bubble goes to the surface, it's vibrating some fluid around it. But as, as it goes to the surface, there's less fluid to vibrate, and the, the bubble actually vibrates at a higher frequency. And this produces a sort of a characteristic bloop or a rising pitch uh, sound. And hopefully you can hear it right here. So let me play that again. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, so it's very subtle, but actually, uh, you know, you can, we respond to frequency changes. Um, so just as a comparison, so you can see for yourself the effect of this little difference, we did a simulation with and without the bubble pitch increase. Second one more, more um, makes you thirstier, I guess. Okay. Okay. So we use a really simple model to model the frequency change as the bubble goes to the surface by monitoring level set values, and I won't really go in much more into it than that. Okay. So the interesting part um, turned out to be modeling the the radiation of the fluid and how the vibrations produce the sound, and. Um, in particular, we essentially don't know the vibration of the surface at all. We only know the, the vibration of the bubble, which is something inside the fluid. And so one model is just to look at the amplitudes of vibration of the, of the bubbles and sum those together to make a sound. But in reality, you know there's some extra weighting factor, some transfer function that says certain bubbles are, are, are louder than other ones and so on in some parts around the object. And so in practice, we, we model the sound as a linear superposition of bubble vibrations weighted by some transfer functions uh, that we'd like to evaluate. Um, so if you, you can always ignore the transfer function, and maybe it still sounds good, but unfortunately, we don't think it does. And, um, and one reason is that the transfer function, if you look at the amplitudes of these values, they actually differ in amplitude by over 100-fold uh, throughout the simulation. And so there's lots of spatial and temporal variation in how loud any given bubble is, depending on where it is and, and, and uh, what its frequency is. And so we'd like to capture that variation. So here's a comparison so you can see without transfer, where you essentially assume the transfer function is just one, and if we include the transfer function that we'll model. found the second one slightly more interesting. Um, it's also, I should mention that, it, again, this, 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 this listening environment is slightly non-ideal. If you listen with headphones, you'll actually be able to hear the sounds better. Okay. Um, so the basic problem we have to do is figure out how a bubble inside the fluid produces waves that radiate to you, out to your ear. And we can model, basically, the bubble as a little divergent source inside, inside a, a, the fluid that's producing waves and solve essentially the wave equation in the frequency domain or the Helmholtz equation. So there's some wave number which determines essentially the wavelength. And it's, it's different in the fluid than it is outside the fluid, which is irritating. Um, but we can solve it somehow to figure out this transfer function uh, subject to this forcing. So one problem is that we need to do this a lot. So we have maybe a complex fluid domain that's changing over time. And we've maybe got thousands of bubbles and the bubbles are moving around and making sound. So we have to essentially solve this Helmholtz problem maybe hundreds of thousands of times, maybe you know, millions. And so how can we solve this thing uh, that many times? Uh, we can do it by basically inventing a solver that's relatively low accuracy that can be run in parallel, and that's what we do. So we basically use a dual domain approach where we sim simulate the vibration of the fluid by solving a fluid domain problem, get, figure out how the surface vibrates, and then use the vibration of the fluid to figure out how it radiates into the surrounding air. And that's essentially what we do. And we solve each of these using a boundary integral type approach, which can be made very fast. OK. So just to give you, I want to give you a little sketch of how we do this. It's essentially like what I talked about before, where you can put equivalent sources inside an object to figure out, to approximate its radiation field. And so essentially, there's a little bubble that's making some vibrations. And uh, essentially, we can think of this as the sound field, but it doesn't actually produce the right, the, the, match the boundary conditions for having no vibrations on the boundary and, and so on. And so we can have a source for the sound, but we need to add extra sources inside the fluid, essentially, to help it match the boundary conditions uh, associated with the problem. And so essentially, our model for the pressure inside the fluid is that there's some uh, source term due to our little vibrating monopole source, and then some other stuff we add. 
And we're going to try to find these magic coefficients such that they satisfy the boundary conditions uh, for this problem. And so we're just going to solve for the coefficients using least squares. In practice, we use up to quadrupole uh, vibration sources in the fluid. Uh, these are actually regular sources, so they're not singular. And, um, and so essentially the problem boils down to satisfying boundary conditions on the fluid surface and solid boundaries. What we need to do is essentially make sure what we, what we actually do is sample different locations on the interface and impose boundary conditions there. And this basically gives us a linear constraint on the coefficients, uh, just a plane equation for the coefficients, which we can assemble into a, a linear system and solve for the coefficients at, to figure out what they are in a least square sense. So basically, it boils down to solving for some coefficients using least squares. Okay? And if you do that, then you can figure out, uh, as you add more sources inside the volume, you can better estimate the, the vibration of the surface to figure out what kind of vibration is, is producing the sound. Once you know the vibration of the surface, then you can try to figure out how that thing produces sound into the air where you listen to it. And it's essentially, uh, you know, we do essentially do the same thing again. In this case, we place singular sound sources that will radiate sound to infinity inside the fluid. And then we're going to estimate the amplitudes of these guys such that they match the vibration boundary condition and the fact that the boundaries otherwise don't vibrate. And this gives us a model for the transfer function in the, in the air where we're going to listen to it. So we estimate the coefficients uh, using these squares, using quadrupole sources again in this case. And the only interesting thing in this case is that now we know how the surface vibrates. So we get an extra term on our right-hand side that tells us essentially how the, how, the, how the sound must be driven. Anyway, to make a short story shorter, um, we basically, as we add more and more quadrupole sources to the fluid domain, we can estimate the sound radiation uh, better. So these are very approximate uh, estimates of the solution. We can always solve for it using a full-blown Helmholtz solver, but remember that we have to essentially do this hundreds of thousands of times in order to estimate the sound for sound rendering. So we have Another issue is that the human hearing sensitivity is pretty limited in terms of the pressure accuracy, so we can use lower accuracy solutions. One issue that turns out in practice is that because these least squares problems are very ill-posed and the geometry is changing over time, you have to worry about regularization of that least squares problem so you don't get popping noise and other noise artifacts. And we use a, a, a particular method that avoids, uh, that can be made temporally coherent, unlike truncated SVD. Uh, another issue is that as the bubble goes to the boundary, we have a singularity that goes to the boundary of our boundary integral equation, essentially, and that can be a problem. And it always goes to the boundary because it's a bubble, right? It's trying to go to the surface. And so in practice, we offset our boundary uh, sample slightly to avoid uh, this. Uh, okay, so the actual approach then sounds like this. Um, we basically uh, simulate the fluid and produce the bubbles. And then for each bubble, then at runtime when we're producing the sound, we load the frequencies and level set values along the trajectory of the bubble and the transfer function that we computed ahead of time. And then basically for each bubble, we estimate its frequency due to the rising pitch effect and time step the little vibrations of that bubble as it's moving around. And then for the listener, we basically figure out how loud that sound is using the transfer function and a head-related transfer function. Uh, as well. And then we can use that to produce the sound at the listening position. And finally, that sound actually gets written out uh, to disk uh, or displayed interactively if it's a real-time application. Um, so in, in, this, in this example, all the sounds are computed offline ahead of time and stored to disk. We simulate the fluid on a 16-core uh, Xeon machine, and the sound is, is rendered in parallel on an 80-core uh, cluster. Um, so, yeah, try headphones. It'll sound a little bit better. Okay, so the examples we simulated were pouring water. So this produces about a stream of about 8,000 bubbles, and it took about five seconds per transfer solve uh, for each bubble, and so there's a lot of solves. So it took about six hours in total on this parallel machine. So this is the actual surface velocity summed for all the bubbles that's occurring during the simulation. You can see the fluid moving, but very, very slowly because it's uh, 
These are audio rates. And we also synthesized a, a volume rendering of the, of the sound field approximation, not because we need to to produce sound, but just to show you what sort of stuff is going on there. And another example we made was a splash, which is a very short transient sound with only a small number of bubbles, so it's actually uh, less work to actually simulate the sound. And then we also compared it to a real sound by swapping it in. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I don't think you'll be able to hear the, the difference. Um, another example we did was with just uh, a droplet. So it only produced 14 bubbles. Uh, and uh, there's not a lot of transfer cells, so it's less work, although most of the simulation costs is fluid. And this is a case with the, the pouring with the moving camera. And finally, finally here's the pour for that one step. Okay, so I should just mention the cost of computing this. Um, so the, most of the cost in our current implementation is just updating the level set because it's not parallelized effectively. Um, so these are in hours, so the fluid simulation cost versus level sets. And the radiation cost, because it's parallelized, is, is quite low. The final listening process of listening to the sound is very cheap and can be run in real time in practice. Um, so there's code online for that part. And uh, in summary, this is essentially the first approach for synthesizing fluid sounds for 3D fluid animations. Uh, and the key idea is to have a parallel algorithm for the radiation. Um, there's a lot of f future work on how to make this better and make the sounds better, how to make it more general for larger bubbles and bob bubbling, popping, emerging, and simulating beer and you know all these things, making it faster. Um, so in summary, I think I've showed you that you know, my bottling the vibrations of the structures and modeling the sound radiation using the wave equation uh, and using model reduction techniques, we can make sound rendering practical uh, for all kinds of new applications. So this isn't by any thought uh, the, the, the end of it. It's just this, we're just scratching the surface. Um, so there's all kinds of things we can't compute sound for, such as like just crumpling paper or fracture sounds, all kinds of things. Like when you have not just an algorithm for one object or this object or another object in a separate case for everything, you really want to simulate everything together in a systems approach just like we do in computer animation. So that means multi-physics support. You know, how do you synthesize sounds for the proverbial car crashing into the burning stack of television sets? You know, all these things, you know, uh, we can't do, how do we do them? So it's not just one object, but multiple objects interacting, coupling with contact, coupling with the transfer and radiation. How do we make this faster for interactive applications or so we can scale it up to large, huge applications like in motion pictures or interactive virtual environments on your PlayStation 10? How do we make it so that we only compute what you actually hear and not just everything to some numerical accuracy. We need perception and validation studies, just like we did in global illumination for like the Cornell box. We need it for sound so we know what to compute and not just everything. And also, finally, we need to rethink the animation pipeline. So instead of just generating frames and making a movie and rendering the sound afterwards, we should have the graphics and the physics and the sound all in one to let the creative process be a complete holistic experience. And uh, finally, I just want to mention some very preliminary work that my student Chauncey is doing on fracture synthesis. These are some nice photos by a, a famous artist. Uh, here, so here's a first example. So obviously, we didn't we didn't we didn't do it yet. Uh, uh, so we tried harder, and then he threw it a little harder this time. And uh, slightly differently. And so we're currently working on synthesizing two plates. OK, so I'd like to acknowledge my students, uh, Chauncey Zhang, Jeffrey Chadwick, Stephen Ahn, my postdoc Ted Kim, and other student Yerne Barbich, and also Dinesh for early collaboration and also just infinite inspiration during my PhD. And I'd like to thank our, 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 our sponsors for all their our support. And also thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot.